I, I remember when I started back in 1974. Actually, I'm, you know, 40 years old in the Lord this past, this past month. 40 years. Can you imagine how fast that goes by? You, you never realize how fast it goes until it's gone. How many know what I'm talking about? And I never realized how much God would do. And it, it's, it's a wonderful journey. And I want you to know that God has, a, has you on a wonderful journey here today. And the message that I'm going to declare to you today, I want to get point, this point, the importance of, of how faith is in your life. One of the things that I had in an early, earlier time in my walk was the development of this in my life. And it's so important that you understand that this concept within Scripture. We're going to deal with how to develop your faith in God for the next several weeks here. And today I want to talk about the importance of that. Because if you don't realize the importance of that, then you'll never get very far with the things of God. So let's pray right now and ask God to help us. Holy Spirit, we just thank you because you can, you can just take over any time you choose. Lord, I, you're in charge already. And I'm, I'm your vessel. The, you would just lead me as whatever you direct, Lord Father. To, Lord Father, if you want me to go in another direction during this, Lord, I am obedient to you, Lord God. I'm not tied down to what I want or what we think, but what you want, Lord Father. I thank you for just ministering to the people now. Lord God, a now fresh word that will touch their heart, touch their minds, touch their spirit, man. And, Lord Father, that they will begin to go beyond where they are to where you need them to be. We thank you for it now. In the wonderful name of Jesus and all the redeemed said, the importance of faith in your life here and how to develop it, of course, first of all, we're starting. The very first thing I want to establish is that fact that this is one of the most, most, if not the most important thing you can learn how to do as a believer. I am absolutely convinced that, the, that this subject is, is probably the number one thing you should learn after you get saved. And the reason for that is this. Everything, say everything. Everything in the Bible works and operates on faith. And if you don't know how to work that, you will not be successful. And therefore, you and I need to learn how to develop our faith and understand that it must become an important, listen, priority. It must become a priority. That means it takes precedence. It must take a first place in our life to the point that we get this down because the more that we get this down, then the more successful we do. And, as, and if we don't, guess what's going to happen? You're not. And this is some of the reason why some of us are not successful in the things of God and we become frustrated and become uh, disillusioned by the things that are coming upon us because we think, well, that must be God's will for me not to have it. And, and God wants you to have the blessings. God wants you to grow in the things of God. And it's so important and imperative that you do that and you understand this. Now, when we look at this subject of faith, I, what, how does it compare to the other subjects in the Bible, like salvation or healing or, or walking with God or, 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 all the, or giving? How does it compare? And if we look at one of the scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we'll put that up there, verse 13, we hear one of the most famous scriptures that we have ever seen or ever heard in our, on our Christian walk, and that is this. And now by the faith, hope, and love, these three, Paul says, but the greatest of these is love or charity. Now, I want you to understand something, and I, I know this is true because we, we have been in, how many have been in church most of their life? Let me see your hands. Pretty much all of our lives, we've heard that love is the most important thing in our, in our walk with God. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, and if you would allow me to understand, to teach you here and minister today, I want you to see how faith is even more important and why. Now, I'm not saying that you don't need love and it's not in any of an importance or not to take the place of love, but as far as a priority within our lives, it has to become a priority. I want to, how many of us see things happen in your life from God? Let me see. Well, this is why you need to study this thing. Listen, you need to learn about faith and, and more than love because there's going to be a lot of people in your life that are not going to be lovely. And you're going to need faith to love them. How many have already met in their lifetime people that have had issues with? Guess what? The Bible is compelling you and telling you that you have to love them. Now, how can you love them without faith? 
So we need to understand there are many people like this. So that, you might say, well, that's not what it's saying, Pastor John. Listen to what it's saying. It's saying, now, abide in faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is, is love. Now, if you just look at this verse from its face value, which many people do, unfortunately, we have that concept as, as Christians sometimes. We open our Bible and expect, okay, that one. Well, that's the wrong way to study God's word. God wants you to understand there's a better way to understand God's word. We must understand this passage within the context the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians about. And unfortunately, most of the people there that have interpreted the scripture are saying this, that love is the most important thing. And I am not in any way saying it's not important. But what I'm saying, however, is that Paul is bringing out the idea as far as the priority of it the priority of faith and understanding the, the concept of love and faith together. It's not what, what Paul's saying here in 1 Corinthians then. He's saying something totally different when he looks at this scripture. There was a problem in the Corinthian church. They were like us. They were a spirit-filled, charismatic church, and there was a lot of people that were unlearned, unfortunately, in the things of the Lord, and they start to walk in, in the realm of the supernatural, and they started to do all kinds of miracle signs and wonders. Listen, miracle signs and wonders are not a sign of maturity. They are not. Matter of fact, there's not a person in the book of Corinthians that would be qualified to even be a deacon. Even though that happened, even though they walked in the supernatural, even though they had all kinds of manifestations of God, in which we won, in which we won. How many want the manifestations of God in their life and in the church? But they left out something. They were doing it out of an arrogant attitude, out of a spirit that was not in line with God's word. So the Apostle Paul is here, and what he does is he inserts this love chapter. And I'm not talking about something goofy here. I'm talking about the real God love that's unconditional, the compassion of God, the move of God. And in, he places 1 Corinthians between these two chapters, chapter 12 and chapter 14, to show the believers how they are to operate out of love. Now, I want you to listen to, say, to this, and this is very important. Say this out, out loud. Love is the greatest motivator. And that's the primary reason why we do what we should be doing. The reason why you're here today is not because of uh, just to show off your nice clothes or, or just to see somebody and all that's nice and there for two. But you should be here because you love God. You should be reading the Bible, and we do read the Bible because we love God. We give because of one thing. We should be giving because we love God. We should do everything in it. We, can, we, we should do everything because of our love. Love is a, a motivator. When Jesus was out looking at the crowds, there were, there were sometimes some pitiful situations. And the love of God inside of Christ, the, the heart of God inside of the Son of Man, anointed by the Holy Ghost, moved him into compassion, where he was drawn to out of a love that's not expecting anything back because there was nothing for these people to give them him. And they were, he was motivated by love to do what he did. And because he was motivated by love to do what he did, then God was able to work through that. You all here with me? Say amen. Now, I'm not motivated by faith and hope. I'm motivated by love. Say this out loud. I am motivated by love. Look to your neighbor and say, I am motivated by love to love you. Amen. Hallelujah. And we need to understand this. It's so important. So love is that motivator, but faith is the activator. Say, faith activates. What kind of faith puts into place everything. It activates. It, put, it, it gets you into action. It gets you into a position of doing. Because now you're now doing it. activates love. What activates love? What activates faith? What activates all the things of God? What activates them? Faith activates Hallelujah. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul reveals how faith is supposed to work. He says this, and it's not there, so don't say anything. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, it says, Faith which worketh by love. Faith works by love. Oh, and that's a neat word there, by. It actually means through. It's the word D in the Greek. And it means 
Faith works through the motivation of love. That's how faith moves. Now, this is how we are to operate in faith, but that's a whole new subject when you talk about that love thing, and we need to learn how to walk the love walk with God because what we need to understand is how to activate the love of God. We need to learn how to activate the things of God. We need to learn how to activate faith. We need to learn how to activate love, activate healing, activate all the things of God. And guess what? You need to learn how important it is. It's very vitally important that you understand. Because if you don't know what it is and you know how, how to work it, then you're just going to mess up. That's why a lot of people mess up in their walk with God. Faith is what activates and moves the hand of God. It moves us into the realm of the supernatural. It moves us into the realm of what is not seen. It moves us into that realm where we can receive things that are not even there yet. Hallelujah. And I want to show you now again this subject today, what we're dealing with, is specifically showing you the importance of why you need to understand what faith is and how it works. The importance of faith in your life. Uh, just a few months ago, about four months ago, I asked the Lord to reteach me about this subject because let me just tell you something. God's word is pregnant. Ladies, how many know what it's like to be pregnant? Okay? That means there's always something more there than what you have read before. Every time I get into the Word of God, there's something more. I've been in it 40 years, and let me just tell you something. I'm still learning about the things of God because there's layers and layers of revelation knowledge that God has in the Word of God. And as you study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of God, God will begin to increase this knowledge so that you can walk in perfection. You can walk and not lose. For many years, I wanted to say, Lord, just show me how it works because I want to win. How many want to win every time? Just show me how it works. We're not after manipulation of God. We're after submission to God. We're after going after the things of God so that he can work through us and in us and out of us. Now, in him we live and move and have our being. And so we need to learn how to do that. But we must learn the importance of it and make this subject, above all the others, a priority. So let me show you how we must, everybody say must, and I'll talk about that a minute because that's so important that you must, you must, you must do this. It's not should you or could, now you don't have to do anything, but if you want God's stuff, you must do this. I want you to put up there Romans chapter 1 verse 17. Some of you know these scriptures by heart, but that's okay. Because faith comes by the continual hearing. Let me just show you something about that word first, that where it says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Over the years in your life, if you kept on hearing something, if you kept on hearing anything, if you heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it, and for 20 years you've heard it, by the time you're 20 years later, that thing that you heard becomes so resonant within your heart and your mind that you just understand that that's the way it is, and therefore you act accordingly, and that's exactly what the Word of God is saying. As you begin to hear and hear and keep on hearing, over the course of time, the Word of God will find place in your life that, man, this is what the way it is, and therefore I walk and talk like it says. And here's what the Apostle Paul says about the importance of this. For therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. What that means is it begins with faith and it then ends with faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by That's how we're supposed to live. Now, if you look at that one word, which is so unique there, that word just, if you go back to its, its, its meaning... It means that those who have accepted Jesus and have been declared righteous, those who have been declared, so we can look at it, it says, those who have been declared righteous, they have to live by faith. That's the way we live. Now, we should understand the importance of this. Now, there's a neat thing that you understand. This scripture, the just shall live by faith, occurs four times in the whole Bible. The one time in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, Romans chapter 1, Galatians chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 10, and this is the very scripture. Now listen to me closely now because you'll miss it. This is the very scripture that Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, 
Martin Luther, back in the 15th century, back in the 1500, excuse me, the 1600, 16th century, this was the very verse that he had a revelation of, the catalyst verse that he had that broke him away from salvation by works to a salvation by faith alone. This is the way it works. He realized, and man, because of that, we're here today. We are, hallelujah, and I used to be a good Catholic boy, and if you're Catholic, thank God you can still go to heaven and everything like that. Thank God for the Catholic people. But thank God for people of faith that break away from tradition and, and man's religion to go to the word of God. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. He broke away. And I'll tell you right now, if you want to break away from tradition, because some of the stuff that you and I have been taught over the period of time in our lives, it can be destructive. Because there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. The Bible teaches us that. But the end thereof is the ways of death. Listen, if you're taught by God, the end thereof is the ways of life. Blessings. God doesn't want you to lose. He calls you winners. Thanks be to God that always calls us up to what? Triumph in Christ Jesus. So the Martin Luther understood this. And he, we, what we need to understand as well, it, it, that we are justified by this faith thing. But if you don't know what faith is and how it works, how can you live by it? How can you do it? It's important that you understand why it's important to us. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, if you would. Here's a familiar passage of Scripture. But you need to learn. Study to what? Show yourself uh, proved. For by grace are you saved through what? Through what? So again, it's proving us here that we're not only to live by this thing, our very salvation rests upon, our very salvation. You can't go to heaven without this. And not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Look at verse 9. Not of works, at least any man should boast. This is not a work thing. This is a faith thing that's in God alone. God wants you to understand that it's by faith that you are saved. Well, if it's by faith that we're saved, then it must be very important that I understand what it is and how it works. If you don't understand what it is and how it works, then how are you going to be actually saved? That's why people run to the altar even after they made a confession of faith, and you'll see them several times run to the altar and want to get saved again. Well, that's because they didn't understand what they got in the first place. Hallelujah. Raise your hand if you're saved here. Let me see your hand. Come on, raise your hand like you're really proud. Wave it to the Lord and say, thank God I'm saved. Hallelujah. Look to your neighbor and say, thank God you are. <laughs> thank God you're saved. But you're not going to be saved. You are saved. And because of that fact, you're going to heaven. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to shout. I'm going to heaven. This is not my resting place. Listen, this is all nice and good, but I'm, I'm ready for heaven. I'm ready to go. But you know what? This is why the Bible says that you may know that you have eternal life. I know. How many know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you're saved on your way and heaven is bound? Hallelujah. One of the guys that got it, unfortunately got his head cut off by this Islamic terrorist, he wrote home to his mom and said, I hope, and I'm not trying to mock him, I hope that I see you in heaven. Well, we don't have to hope. We can know. Thank God for that person. Thank God that for America. We need to pray for, our, for those brothers, that family. But let me just tell you, you don't have to have a natural hope. You need to know so about the things of God. And that's what it says in the Word of God here. We're saved by what? Faith. It's saved by faith. We're saved by faith. We're saved by this stuff. It's stuff that this changes us. I remember when I first got saved. I'll never forget in August 1st, 1974 in Calvary Temple, Allentown, Pennsylvania. I, did, I just so Im imprinted in my heart that I can revisit it every time. I know you've heard that, but I, I, I'll never forget what happened. It's just the power of God came on me so strongly, and I came up front, and I didn't even know how to pray, but God had people around there to lead me through to the sinner's prayer. I'm so glad I'm saved here today. Amen. Have not stopped. Forty years later, 
It's just getting better. Another scripture that we look at in 1 Timothy chapter 6, I like this one. Hallelujah. The importance of faith here. Fight the good fight of what? Fight the good fight of what? That's the good fight. Laying hold of eternal life whereunto thou also art called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now let me just say something about this. It's so important you understand this. And for years I didn't understand this as, as a believer. For several years, maybe 10, 20 years, I was fighting the devil and fighting this and fighting that and fighting everything around me. But the only fight that you have is the good fight of faith. You don't have to fight the preacher. You don't have to fight the church. You don't have to fight the situation. Listen, you don't even have to fight the devil or demons. This is where I missed it. Because so many people are out there trying to wage war against a spiritual enemy that there is no way if you went head to head with it that you're able to compete with a de- Even a baby demon can knock you right over the head and kill you. So you have to understand you're not fighting that. It's the good fight of what? The good fight. It's everywhere in the New Testament. You don't see it's the good fight against the devil or the good fight against the situation or the good fight against your healing, against your sickness. It's the good fight of what? Now, here's what it's meaning. The good fight of faith is what? Here's what happens. Satan, he tries. His objective is to get you out of faith. We need to understand something. Listen, before I even go on, Satan has already been defeated. Now, to say otherwise is to, to in, in, in a way, insult the work of Jesus Christ. Because it's an already, it is what? Finished. He already won. It's already won. So we have this enemy out there that's loose, just like some gangs on a street in which we need to exercise our authority over and take charge over. We need to round them up. But we don't need to fight the devil in that sense. We need to fight the good fight. What he tries to do is divert your attention off your faith, the word of God, onto the problem. I see so many people. The biggest problem, the biggest enemy you got against you is yourself and fear. He tries to get you in fear because that's his realm. This world is controlled by Satan, and that's his realm, the world of fear. It's not the world of faith. The world of faith is God's realm. I want you to understand something. So we have the enemy that comes up against us. He tries to divert our attention by situations, by circumstances, by physical pain, by, by, by somebody getting mad at you, and you start to look not at the Lord, but at the situation. And at that moment, you've gotten your eyes off of God's word and Jesus. And that's when you start to sink. Remember Peter? Jesus gave him a word, and that word was come. One word. Now, you talk about the potency of God's word. The potency of God's word is so powerful that one word will put you over. One word. Thank God for my little daughter. One tissue. (laughs) One word will put you over. He came, and he walked on the word of God. He walked on the water, on the water, but not actually the water. He walked on faith in the word of God. What happened? All of a sudden, the wind became boisterous, the wave became turbulent, and he took his eyes off of Jesus and the word. At that very moment, at that very second, he begins to sink. That is the way it works in your life. You begin to look at the situation, and it's natural to have these things come on us because we're subject to to these things because we have been so trained by our physical senses that that's the way we get knowledge, and it is. And so when we have pain, we feel, oh, God. Or the situation comes, oh, ow, how are we going to do it? And so we, we, we become diverted off our focus. I was dealing with this with my daughter today. She had a little stomach ache. I said, this is a wonderful lesson for to teach you how to exercise your faith, okay? 
I said, Victoria, we're riding down the road. I said, I'm next to you. Make believe I'm your stomach ache. Usually that happens anyway. <laughs> I said, just make believe I'm your stomach ache. I said, but you're going to drive. You can't. I'm still here. You know, we don't deny the fact that that's there. We do deny the right, right for it to dictate to us. We don't say that the devil's not there, the sickness is not there, the cancer's not there, the pain's not there. We don't say that. We know that it's there because God tells us it's there. But we are not to look at it. And so the, I said, keep your eyes focused, just like Peter needed to keep his eyes focused on the Lord. I'm telling you, we need to fight the good fight of faith. You need to stay in faith. How do you stay in faith? You need to be focused. Look on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, who the joy before him endured the cross, devising the same. Look unto him, lest you be weary and faint in your mind. In your mind, it'll just kind of all squirrely kind. Look to your neighbor and say, squirrely things happen in your mind. That's the truth. All kinds of squirrely things happen in your mind. And you get diverted. Keep your eyes on God and his word. Keep your eyes. Now, that means you ignore it. You ignore this. It doesn't, you know, I have had people in my life, unfortunately, that I have, I have ignored. But they're still there. And that's how you're supposed to treat the situation. We're supposed to do two things here concerning the devil. Now, listen to this. Now, I want you to say this out loud. Resist and rebuke. They both begin with the letter R. Isn't that nice? Resist and rebuke. This is how it happens. When the enemy comes up against you who knows that he is already defeated but doesn't know that you know he's already defeated. And if you do know what you know that he's defeated, then this is how you do it. You resist and rebuke. Now, James chapter 4, it's not up there, but it says this. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. And what? Who's running from who? The devil is going to run from you. Why? You are resisting him. How do you resist him, Pastor John? By speaking the word and not accepting that as a truth. Listen, you are not that bad that you think all those bad thoughts all the time. That all that situation comes up against you all the time. When those situations come up against you, you have to understand there's two other sources that can come from. The world or God or Satan or the flesh, those sources... And you need to understand where that's coming from. If it's so bad, listen, that's not mine. That's not mine. I resist that thought. It's an offense. And I also am speaking the word of God. You know what? I am blessed. I am blessed. I said, I am blessed. I am blessed. I am blessed. I, had, I woke up last night. I'm going to be very uh, transparent here. I woke up last night. I had a bad dream. And my wife goes, looks over to me and says, What's wrong? I said, well, I had a kind of interesting dream. She says, you okay? I said, I'm blessed. She says, what was it about? I said, I'm blessed. She says, what, 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 you okay? I said, I'm blessed. Now, I could have said, well, you know, I saw this. Uncle Harry was dying in my arms. I don't have an Uncle Harry. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. But you don't deny the fact that something is there you ignore for it to take residence and precedence in your life where it dictates to you. So you resist, and then you rebuke. Now, I want you to say, as in Matthew, Matthew chapter 17, verse 18, it says, And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of that person, and the child was cured from that very hour. Uh, that word rebuke means something. Resist, rebuke. When an enemy comes around you, you got authority. Exercise it. Get out of here, devil. In the name of, say, in the name of Jesus, be gone. You don't have to know a lot of the Bible. Just so, in the name of Jesus, be gone. That's not my thought. That's not from, you, from God. I don't accept that. I'm going to walk in faith. I'm going to keep my eyes on the word of God. I'm going to go forward in the things of the Lord. I'm not going to respond in the things of, of the enemy. So you rebuke and resist. Let me just teach you a couple more things. 
Jesus was on the, in a boat, and they had a, a, a real wonderful ministry time. And, and they were going across the Galilee or one of the, there, and, they were, and Jesus was in the back of the boat. And doggone it, Jesus was sleeping. And here a storm came up. Jesus is sleeping in, in a storm. It shows you where you can be if you have your mind set on the Lord. And he shall keep you in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on him. And he shall keep you in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on him. And he shall keep you in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on him. So he's sleeping. The disciples are going frantic. They're going crazy. They're, they're flipping out. They're all of a sudden in the natural. I don't know about you, but I don't like to go out in the water where it kind of comes over on the inside the ship. I'd rather be on dry ground. How many would like to have that? Amen. And now I'd be freaking out too. I mean, we're going under. We got all this. Jesus, Jesus, hello. <laughs> Wake up. Now, here's the thing you understand. Jesus gets up. And he rebukes the storm and the waves. The storm and the waves. This was a demonic attack. Okay? Jesus said this before they got into the boat. We're going over to the other side. That was a fact. Now, in, in the mind of Christ, he was going over to the other side. In the minds of the, of the disciples, they were uncertain. Now, here's what you need to understand. Two things, they all, again, both begin with the letter R. You either react or respond. Whenever you react, fear comes. You receive bad news. You have cancer. That is scary in the natural. You have leukemia or you have a financial difficulty. The, the natural reaction, I said the natural reaction is to react. The natural reaction to reaction or that is fear. Now, what Jesus did was totally different. He stands up in the boat. Listen to me now. He stands up in the boat, saw the same wave, saw the same situation, was under the same issue that the other disciples was. He gets up and rebukes the storm and the waves. Now he responds. How do you respond when problems come your way? That doesn't mean that they weren't there, because they certainly were. We're fighting a good fight of, you're supposed to stay in what? You're supposed to stay focused upon what? The answer. And because of that, he responds and speaks. He resists and rebukes. And the disciples reacted in fear. And that's why he said, oh, ye of little faith. Little faith. They had some, but it was little. And that's why we need to understand. Now, let me just tell you something. If you're going to fight the good fight of faith, you need to understand how, what faith is. And you need to understand how it operates. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to. That's why people mess up. That's why people give up on church, give up on Christianity, give it up on the things of God. I remember when my first wife, she passed away of leukemia, okay? Everybody has a free will. That's why you need to get where you need to be so that doesn't happen. And I remember the next week I still stayed in church. I did a funeral the next Saturday. And from that point on, I haven't missed a service except for vacation, which I thoroughly enjoy. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. What I'm telling you is you need to keep on going on. Situations should not dictate your theology. Some of you didn't get that. Situations and circumstances should not dictate your theology. If that is, let me explain and write it down and break it down. If situations affect the way you believe, then what you believe is really not a belief. Are you all here this morning? You've got to be taught from God. I remember Kenneth Hagin said this, you only know what you've been taught, and you only do what you believe. 
You have to do the word of God. You've got to do what it says. You've got to be with the word of God. And when you stay in faith, there's no way the devil can defeat you. There's no way. Listen, you can find out how to get over on this thing. You don't have to be subject to, to turmoil and situations. A lot of people say, well, you learn by your mistakes. Oh, yes, you can, but that's not the best way. <laughs> Listen, I can be in California, and I can drive from California to New York in a car. That's a good way, but there's a better way. I can get Janice and I, and we can buy a ticket first class and fly. And that's a better way. That's a better way. How many believe that's a better way? I mean, flying first class is a whole lot better than doing what, 17 hours? 18, 20 hours? I have never driven it, so I have no clue and don't intend to. Say amen. <laughs> there's a better way. I said there's a better way to get out of your circumstances. I said there's a better way to overcome your situation. I said there's a better way to, than getting sick. I said, there's a better way. I might as well go ahead and do it. Hallelujah. God's good. God wants you to walk in health. God wants you to walk in health. Now, you know what that means? That means some of you need to watch how you eat. Exercise. Maintain social goodness. Spiritually. Mentally. I was talking to a guy, and I... I, I I'm just going to go by the Lord. Is that okay here today? Hallelujah. I was talking to one of my friends, and he had this uh, Taurus, and, he, and it, was, it was in excellent condition. It had over 250,000 miles on it. And I said, how's it running? He said, it runs like a champ. I think it was a 90-something. Still looked great. Still good. I said, well, why is it running so good? He says, because every time it needs oil, every 3,000 miles, I change it. He says, every time it needs tires, I change it when it needs it, not when they go bald. Every time it needs, every time that it needs a part replaced, I replace it. Every time that it's in that situation. So there's no, I maintain it. He said, you maintain it? He says, yeah, I maintain that car so it's in good condition. And all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me. He says, that's what 3 John verse 2 says. He says, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in maintenance health. Maintain good health. I got three tooth. I got a tooth. I got to get some uh, caps on. Now, I can wait for a miracle for God to pop some teeth in my mouth. And he can or I can go to Dennis and get a triple crown. In the meantime, I'm going to Dennis. Say amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Why? I have to maintain. I don't know why I'm on this, but that's okay. I have to maintain good health. And that's why Janice and I are exercising. Not that I like exercising, as you can see. Hallelujah. But because you have to. Kenneth Hagin, I think, died in his 70s of a heart attack. That's because... If you ever known Kenneth Hagin, he was the greatest man of faith that we know, but he was overweight. Some of us are ticking time bombs here. We allow a door open for the enemy to get in. I wish above all things that you prosper and maintain good health, even as your soul prospers. Then you won't get sick. Because Jesus, James says, is there any among you that are sick? It's a question. It's a question. Is there anybody here? You know, because it's really not normal for you to be that way. Wow. Totally different than what we taught. Well, God wanted me to get sick so he can teach me a lesson. If that's the case, God, you can keep that one. Say amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't want that thing. I don't want that. That's not good. Resist, rebuke, react, respond. The point is this. I have to be fighting a good fight of faith. And if I don't know what faith is and how, what it is and how to operate in it, then how can I fight this fight? How can I go victoriously through it? 
Look at this one more, couple more scriptures here. John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. This is neat. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our... That's how you overcome the world. I want you to understand something. There's a God in this world, and he's not Father God, and he's not Jesus God. He's not Holy Ghost. He is known as Satan. The Bible teaches us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, that he's the God of this world. And I don't want to get into the subject there, but that, that's due to the, the uh, Adam giving over the rights of being the, the God of this world while God gave him the authority. That's a whole new subject. But we do know that Satan is now the possessor of this earth. That's why when Jesus was tempted, he, he said to Jesus, all these things I'll give unto you. That wasn't a lie. If it was a lie, how could re Jesus respond to it? It was there. It was his. And it is his. And it's called a world system. And if you have not seen it lately, just look at your news. This is not a God-forsaken world. This is a world that has forsaken God. This is not something that God is doing. We don't blame this on God as a, that's an act of God, a tornado. <laughs> no, it's not. Isn't it a shame we blame God for stuff that he has nothing to do with it? You all here with me, say amen. So if he's the God of this world, if you want to be victorious over this world system, there's only one way to overcome the world system, even our, even our. So if you don't know what it is or how it is and how it operates, then how are you going to overcome this onslaught of world system issues? How? There's no way. Thus, the importance of understanding what faith is and how it works. Don't you see how neat this service, this, this series is going to be for you? You need to be here, everyone. And we'll put it online so you can hear it again and again. One more scripture and we'll close. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. These are familiar. You should know these. by. But it's not just the knowing. It's the working out of this. Read it with me. But without faith, it is impossible to for he that cometh to God must that he is and that he is a of them seek him now don't you understand something without faith it's what impossible impossible now this is not some book from Mormon the book of Mormon this is not some uh, the Quran this is God's word God's word is saying to you, he's saying to you that it's impossible. It is not possible for you to even please him. Listen, coming to church is wonderful. Praying in church is great. Going and giving is great. But listen, the only way to please him is by doing all those things by faith. By faith. By faith. By faith. By faith. By faith. You cannot please him. You can't please him without faith. And that's why you need to understand. And you must. Look at that word must. For he that comes to God, okay, you must. Say must. You must. You, this is not, this is imperative, absolute. You must. If you're going to do it, you've got to do it this way. If you're going to come, you've got to come this way. You must. It's not like how sincere you are. Oh, they love God. They're so wonderful, those people. They've given in the church. They've been in the church. We know that that's true. And we know people that have died that way. I'm here to tell you, it's time to stop that. It's time to live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Now, this might hit home for some of you because some of you have lost loved ones. Well, I have too. And I'm saying to you, Enough is enough. It's time for us to take our place. It's time for us to rise up in the word of God and walk as Brother Mark was singing here today, as sons and daughters of the Most High God. Hallelujah. Come on, people of God. 
If you're an army, you act like it. If you're a believer, you act like it. If you know the faith, you act like it. You're not here to play manby-pamby Christianity. You're here to go forth in the things of God and to preach the word of God with all the power and all the anointing you got. When the devil comes in one way, the spirit of God will come in and raise up a standard against them. My God's God. My God is God. You might not like the way I'm preaching here, but go ahead, live your own way and be unsuccessful. I only found there's one way to live, and that's by faith. That's the way it works. And if I get a little emotional, doggone it, you're going to go to the game today and shout over a little pigskin thing like that and over nothing. I'm going to shout over the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, it's time to go. Hallelujah. <laughs> Come on up, guys. Hallelujah. I bet you're all cold out there. How many are cold out there? How many are high? How many are lukewarm? We're going to spew you out of our mouth. <laughs> God is good. Listen to this. Faith activates. We live by we're saved by, we fight the good fight of, faith. we overcome the world by, we please God by, don't you think it's important? How many think it's important? That's why I want you to live like that, says the Lord. That's why I want you to talk like that and do the things I say. Because when the enemy comes in, when the enemy comes in, he'll have no stand. He'll make not a way. Because you'll speak the word. You'll speak it with authority. You'll speak it with boldness. You'll speak it from your heart. Go ahead, take it. Take your best shot. No evil shall befall me. Neither shall any plague come my dwelling. Now, I want you to know something. Satan will challenge you every step of the way. Just like I was with my daughter in the car, Satan stays there until he knows it's too late, and then we just open the door and kick him right out. Hallelujah. You're supposed to believe. Believe. By Christ I am healed. By Christ I can do all things. By Christ I leave poverty to the possessions of God. By Christ, we're growing. By Christ, we see people saved. Man, we see it all happen. Just close your eyes and visualize all the things that God has for you. See that thing grow. See God inside of you grow. See yourself as already. And if you believe that and you're believing for something now, I want you to stand to your feet and know that that's yours. Go ahead. If you're believing for something, say, yep, I'm standing. And having done all to stand, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Don't give up, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up.